Thanks, Dave. I hear. There we go. Two out of three is good. We good? All right, a little feedback. Good morning. Uh, my name is Matt, and I am currently the lead pastor at Roswell Community Church. <laughs> if this is, uh, this is your first week... <laughs> If this is your first week, it may be a little weird. It's okay. Like, this is an amazing church. We're in a great place. A lot of amazing things are happening. But uh, it is a delight to be able to be with you this morning to open God's Word. Um, Nick Strobel uh, will be the next pastor at RCC. Uh, and there's, in a sense, a changing of the guard that's happening. And I believe it's a really good thing. So there's a new season. And, and for me... Uh, over the next few months, there's going to be a handing over of the mantle of leadership of this church, which I love dearly, which is why I have chosen uh, to lead us in this final series, at least for me, um, through the book of 2 Timothy. And I've called the series Last Words, not because I'm dramatic, though I have been prone to drama at times. <laughs> that is a fact. Um, but precisely because uh, Second Timothy are Paul's last words. They're Paul's handing over of, of a mantle to his young disciples, who happens to be, in this case, Timothy. So let me set up the context of the book, because we're going to spend the next several weeks uh, in the book of, of 2 Timothy. Uh, there's a second because there is a 1 Timothy, so if you find yourselves a little confused, make sure you're on the second book. It is a little bit confusing otherwise, but let me give you a context for what's going on. In, in 2 Timothy, Paul is a prisoner in Nero's Rome. That's not a good Rome to be in, in case you're wondering. Nero, not a good guy. A lot of bad things are happening, and Paul's finding himself imprisoned again. But this time, it's way more severe. If you've read some of the other epistles, you know that, that Paul was at times imprisoned, and, and one particular time he was imprisoned in Rome, but he was like basically on house arrest. So people could come and visit him, and it was kind of an open time, if you will, where he actually was at ease in a home. This is not like that. Most commentators imagine him in some form of like a dungeon-like context with a window up at the top for air and light, but that's about it. He's hard to find. When Asiphorus has to go and search in order to find him, he's in dire straits. Not only that, but um, he's lonely. I, I love 2 Timothy. It's one of my favorite epistles. It's, in my opinion, probably the most vulnerable epistle of the Apostle Paul because he's at the end and he knows it. He's gone through probably one trial at this point, and now he's going to be facing a, a full trial at, at which time he knows already that he is going to be sentenced to death. He'll be executed, and as traditions brought about, yes, it would appear that Paul was executed by, having, by being beheaded as a Roman citizen. But at this moment in time, Paul's not just lonely, he's also rejected. And you heard some of the beginning pieces, and we'll talk about it a little bit later in the letter, but, but everyone's abandoned Paul. Not everyone. Luke's there, and Onesiphorus is there, and a few others. And, and he's writing this letter to Timothy, who's in Ephesus. And, and he's calling for him. But before he calls for him, he imparts things to him. And that's what we're going to spend uh, the next few weeks looking at in particular. This is Paul's last letter. These are his final words. And this is the apostle who's written countless letters to churches across the, across the known world at this time. And he's sitting here choosing in these last days to write to Timothy. To Timothy in particular. One who's spent time working by his side, laboring in difficult circumstances for the past 12, maybe 15 years or so. Paul, it appears, led Timothy to Christ, which is one of the reasons why he calls him my son, my beloved son, my beloved child. Paul had a very unique and deep love for Timothy. Not only had they worked side by side, but he speaks of him in, in Philippians when he says to the church, I have no one else like him. No one else like him. Paul had left Timothy in Ephesus. Uh, it's one of those very like poignant moments where you see Paul 
with the elders, and he gives very clear instructions. He leaves Timothy, young Timothy, who's probably early, maybe mid-30s at this point. He leaves him in Ephesus to do a, key, a couple key important things. One is, one is to select elders and to, to get the church in order, to put some order around worship, to help, to help with the widows and the care for the widows, and also to fight off a whole bunch of heresy that kept growing within the churches. Now, that's a tall order. Like, this isn't like evangelicalism 21st century. Like, this is brand new stuff. And he releases Timothy to be able to step into a lot of this unknown. And what we know about Timothy is that he's Timothy. That's, that's, that was clever. Come on now, give me more than that. I'm going to be gone in a few weeks. Come on. So he's, he's shy. It appears from all that we understand about Timothy, he's like a shy guy. Like, he's by nature just timid. And he's just been dropped with unbelievable responsibilities in Ephesus. And of course here, like, it goes even more so. I think Timothy was probably an introvert and for all introverts in the room, you can imagine to be an introvert and to also be responsible for the care and engagement of entire communities of faith and to not be sure that you have what it takes to do it and yet to have been called and appointed by Paul himself. He's called to this substantial responsibility. It made me think of that, uh, I, think, I think it's Shakespeare. I should have checked. Kind of like I should have checked my, uh, my Beatles birds reference, which everyone reminded me I was wrong on. Um, but I think it's Shakespeare, right? Some are, some are born great. Others have greatness thrust upon them. That's Shakespeare, right? Like Timothy's one of those, like he had greatness thrust upon him. Like he didn't, he didn't, he wasn't born great. Everyone going like, that dude's going to make stuff happen. No, no. He was the guy that's like, I don't know. Maybe a little bit of a mama's boy. We're not sure, we're just, but just not, not the one that you would think is going to be responsible for carrying on the torch of the greatest apostle in the world at that time. In that way, he's a lot like Moses, right? M Moses is sitting at, talking to the Lord, going like, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't talk well, please send someone else, right? And like Jeremiah, who's like, please choose someone else. So, so Timothy is in more in that quadrant. Not a natural, yeah, give me the torch, I'll run with it kind of guy, and yet the torch is handed to him. And in this letter, Paul's reminding Timothy of the preciousness of the gospel that he's entrusted to him. That he had to res assume responsibility for it, that he had to guard it, that he was going to have to teach it, he was going to have to fight for it, and ultimately that he in turn would have to transmit it to a new generation. So in this first chapter that we're going to focus on today, Paul gives Timothy, I, I believe each of us as well, a clear invitation, what I'll call the, the, the first bold command on how to live in this world that I think is captured most clearly in the central verse of this particular chapter, verse 14, when Paul says, Timothy, by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, listen, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Guard the literally beautiful deposit that's been entrusted to you. So we're going to spend the rest of our time looking at these particular passages through the lens of two things. What is this good deposit that's been entrusted to Timothy? What is this good deposit that's been entrusted to you and me? And secondly is how, how do you, how do we, how does Timothy guard it? What does this guarding look like of this good deposit? So what is this deposit that we're guarding? What is he supposed to be guarding? Well, Paul's clearly not calling Timothy to guard his reputation. He's not calling him to guard his retirement. He's not calling him to guard his political affiliations that would have given him some kind of power in the midst of a Nero Rome. He's not telling him to guard his rights. Not telling him to guard his comfort. No, Paul's telling him to guard one thing. He's saying, Timothy, guard the gospel. Guard the gospel. And what is this gospel? Well, Paul articulates it throughout every single one of his epistles multiple times, and he does so here as clearly as can be. What is this gospel? Verse 1 says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, listen, according to the promise of the life of God, 
that is in Christ Jesus. John Stott says that the gospel is the good news for dying sinners that God has promised them a life in Christ Jesus. And Paul is keenly aware that this promise is for life as he stares at death. As he looks at the end, he understands more clearly than ever that this is indeed a promise, promise for life. And he goes on, Paul takes the gospel and then he just blows it open. Verse eight through 10, he says, you wanna know what it is? He says, therefore, just to be clear, do not, therefore do not be ashamed, he said, of the testimony about the Lord nor of me his prisoner, which those are really the same thing ultimately, but share in suffering for the gospel. There it is, by the power of God. Now, what is this gospel? Well, by the power of God who, listen, saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works. If you've been here for any amount of time, it's not because of your works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the age began. He gave it to us free. It is grace, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who did what? What does the gospel make possible? Who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Loved ones, Paul's saying there's one thing that you cannot let slip out of your hands. There is one thing that must be fought for and guarded and held tight, and that is the centrality, the essential, the essential nature of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is that you were dead in your trespasses and sins, and God made you alive in Christ that he rescued and redeemed you through the work of Christ on the cross and by his resurrection, that he sealed you to himself, that he adopted you as a son, as a daughter, that he made you an heir with Christ, that he seated you, Paul says, in the heavenlies with him. The gospel is that good news to you and to me that what separated us from God has been swallowed up. And we now belong to a heavenly father in love by grace. This is the gospel. This is the good news that changes everything forever. If you know and hold and lean on nothing else This is the thing we lean on. If you know all 10 commandments, but you know, don't, you don't know this truth, then, then you're left to be a legalist. If you know all the Kings of the old Testament, well, you may be a scholar, but if you do not know the gospel, you will never be changed. This is the centrality for which Paul fought and wrestled and was stoned and beaten and is in prison facing death. And it is the thing, the one thing that he says to Timothy, this you guard above all else. This you guard. So that's what he is to guard. Now, how in the world do you guard the gospel in you? How does that look? What is some of the pieces that Paul gets to show Timothy and help him know this is the ways in which you guard? I think there's a few that emerge here and I'm gonna walk through them. First, we see that Paul invites Timothy to remember his foundations, his beginnings, where he comes from. And particularly to build on his family foundations. You see this in verse five. He says, I am reminded, Paul says, of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And now I am sure, literally I am certain, dwells in you as well. One of the things that Timothy had is he had demonstrations of faith in his mom, in his grandmother, 
It appears that when the gospel came with Paul, it arrived at Lystra, which is where Timothy was, that, that his grandmother must have come to Christ first and maybe invited her daughter, who was also a Jew at the, and who was married to a Greek. And then at some point here, Timothy gave his life to Christ. And he's saying, Timothy, you, you came to Christ, but you came through a lineage, through a heritage, through women who loved God. And when they heard the message of Christ, took the Old Testament reality and joined it together and were transformed and regenerated by the Holy Spirit. And, and you'd seen it. You'd watched it. And now I just want you to know, Timothy, I, I see it in you as well. It's the same fabric. It's the same essence of faithfulness. You saw it in action, and now I see it in action it, in you. And it, and it wasn't perfect. There's no indication of Timothy's father being involved or engaged or even redeemed, but, but God used all means to draw Timothy and so what did this look like for them? What are the ways in which Timothy was trained up? Well, we're going we're gonna to cheat and run, away, run up to, to, to chapter 3 real quick. But we see here that Timothy was trained, verse 14 of chapter 3. He says, but as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. And how from childhood, this is before the gospel came to him, you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Like from the get-go, Timothy, you're being exposed to the reality of a God who is after his people, who is desirous to have his own people. It reminds me of, um, I was, I've had the, the gift of coming from a foundation of faith that my grandfathers and grandparents put in place and my parents received and then passed on to us. And, and it's funny to me when I think back to what some of those pieces looked like. And yes, it was devotions, which we did sometimes, not always perfectly. And sometimes I didn't want to do them. And we did other things. We went to church faithfully. We were missionaries overseas. And you would think everything was always hunky-dory and it wasn't. Um, but one of the things that uh, I, I realized was, uh, as I was thinking back, on this was just a key moment. We had moved from France, which is where I spent the first 15 years of my life, back to the States. And I didn't read or write English, so I was learning how to read English. I spoke, but didn't read or write. I spoke French, read, read, read and wrote French. And so having to learn to read or write, I, I felt like a fish out of water. I was basically a foreign exchange kid at Milton, basically, who spoke English and looked like he knew what he was doing, but didn't. Um, I just remember, like, I went into a pretty tangible, like, just depression. I felt super lonely. I was having a really hard time connecting, and, and I had a mullet and a butt cut. And so, you know, you just imagine. It's just hard. <laughs> Life is hard in 1989 for a boy who's, you know, 15 years old. So um, you're welcome for no longer the butt cut. Um, and, uh, but there was, this, um, there was this plaque on my bookshelf that had actually been on my bookshelf since as long as I could remember. And it was one that had my name on it, it just said Matthew. And underneath it, it had Isaiah 41.10. Now let me just say, to my knowledge, prior to that season, I don't know that I'd ever read it. Now maybe it's because I didn't read or write English. That's possible, that was part of the case, right? But, but all I know is like, it was just that thing. My brother had one, he didn't have as good of a verse, but whatever, you know. Um, but like, my brother had one too. It's like one of those things you have, right? It's like a, like a Christian heritage thing. It was like, okay, that's fine. And I'll never forget one night in particular where I was just lonely and uncertain and, and just longing for some kind of comfort and find myself looking over at that little placard. And on it, has, as I said, it had Isaiah 41.10. Isaiah 41.10, I'll never forget it. It's, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will hold you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I just read it over and over and over and over, and it got seared into my soul. Now, I, I don't know that mom and dad were planning on like, we're going to get this because Matt's going to be 15 one day. He's going to really have a bad day and a really tough time. And he's going to need this verse. No, but it was part of the fabric that I was raised in. Part of the effect that God used to impact my life to meet me because it was saturated. Not perfectly, but saturated with the truth of God's scripture and the power of his word. There were deposits being made, and I think the question I have for us is, what deposits have been made in you? 
Paul reminds Timothy, says, Timothy, like there's some stuff that got deposited in you early on. And, and my question to you is, what's that been like for you? And then, and then very germane to right now, what deposits are you, you making now? What are the deposits that you're putting into your children, to your classmates, to your, to your family, to your friends? What are the deposits that you're making that are lasting, that remain? In what ways are the scriptures saturating and creating the context where the gospel is appealing, where it sounds like good news because it see, they see it in you and then they see it around you? Now, I know that some of you, like, you don't have good foundations. You weren't raised in a Christian home or you were raised in a context that like maybe was so hypocritical that it actually undid some of the good things that were actually being done. Some of you grew up in just bad houses, rough situations. And so it's like, Matt, that's really nice. You have scripture sitting on your bookshelf that you didn't even ask for. And it is. It's grace. It's mercy. I know that. Like it is the goodness of God. But this is the amazing thing. Is like, it wasn't perfect for Timothy and it wasn't perfect for me. And I know it's been far from perfect for many of you. But it's not the only means. Some of you don't have these strong foundations, but God's pursuit of you indeed has had particular moments and particular markers in your childhood. And, and those markers and those moments are the things that Paul's inviting you to call to heart and call to mind, that God has been pursuing you all of your days. But it's not just, not just foundational. It's not just sovereign foundations built on family foundations. Paul also lead, invites uh, Timothy to, to lean into his spiritual friendships in particular into his mentoring relationships, the one that he's had with, with, uh, with Paul. As I said, he calls Timothy my beloved child. Now, to our knowledge, Paul had no biological children of his own. It doesn't appear he was married. But Timothy was a son to him. And he was clearly a spiritual father to Timothy. And here you hear Paul in verse 3 and in verse 4 expressing, articulating the reality of what this looks like for Timothy to lean in. He says, I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember, verse 4, your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. Spiritual friendships, spiritual friends, God-saturated mentors, they remember us and they remind us. They remember us and they remind us. They hold us up in, in prayer and they, they take us back to the basics. They lead us back to the foundation. They, they rehearse with us the times and the ways in which God has been at work and the ways in which he has refreshed us when we needed him most, especially when the days were dark, the times when our hearts were warmed by the tenderness of God towards us. You hear Paul saying, Timothy, I pray for you. Like I fight for you in prayer that God would intervene in your life. And I also want you to, Timothy, remember, like I'm remembering for you your tears about the way in which you were committed to the very work, this very gospel, and, and, and him as a person. Like I'm remembering it for you. I remember your tears. Timothy, do you remember your tears? Like one of the things that spiritual friendship does is that it invites you to remember the tears, the moments when, when there was no one else to come through but God. They say, do you remember when God, for you, in that time, in that season, in that moment, that there is no other explanation. And so in, your, in the midst of your doubt, in the midst of your uncertainty, let me help you remember. They remember us and they remind us. In 20, uh, 1998, Becky and I moved from Omaha, Nebraska, where I'd been in the, in the Air Force for six years, to Rochester, New York. And I was going to start, I started a, a job at a glass manufacturing company on the production side, management. And I was like, 
so nervous and so scared. I was 24, moving an entire family or two kids across the country. And um, my folks lived in Pennsylvania at the time. And so they met us up in, in Rochester. And I just remember we were at a Holiday Inn and you know we, just, we had just arrived, our stuff hadn't arrived yet. And we'd been driving all day and suddenly we're in a strange place outside of the cocoon that is the military, which is, believe it or not, actually a pretty safe context. They're like, we're gonna make sure you're fed and you have a house and you know, like they take care of you. And suddenly I'm like floating out there all on my own and I feel like I'm 10 again or something. And um, I'll never forget, we're at the Holiday Inn and Becky and the kids go out with my mom um, at the, the little playground there and I'm sitting there with dad and I'm like, dad, I'm like, I'm scared. I feel scared. They're about to go. They're gonna be drive, drive back to Philly. And, I'll never forget, we're sitting on the bed across from each other, and, and he reminded me. One of my dad's favorite phrases, which stuck with me, has stuck with me all these years, is never doubt in the darkness what you've seen in the light. Never doubt in the darkness what you've seen in the light. And in that moment, he reminded me of what the light had looked like. I was like, Matt, think of all the times of what you didn't know before when you weren't sure what you were gonna do after you guys got pregnant, when you weren't sure if you were, where you are gonna move or you're gonna stay in your, you weren't sure what kind of job, how are you gonna get, how are you gonna get your education? And, and God, each time, he, he, he knit those stories together and, and he'll do it again here. I know you can't see it, but he's gonna do it again here. And so don't, don't doubt in the darkness what you already know has been true in the light. And that's what Paul is doing with Timothy here. And that's what spiritual friendship does. This is what the kind of community we've been talking about this year, that's the kind of community that we wanna live with. It's people who remind us. Do you remember the hand of God here? Do you remember the faithfulness of the Lord here? How he has carried you through when you never thought he could. How do we guard the deposit? How do we guard this, what we remember? And we spend time with people who are going to help us remember and be reminded So who's guarding the gospel with you? Who's guarding the gospel deposit in you, with you? Who's reminding you? Who's rehearsing with you? All right, so we remember our foundations, our beginnings. We we lean into spiritual friendships, but we also guard the deposit by, by fighting our natural flesh, our natural flesh tendencies. As I said, um, it is, pretty widely understood by all commentators that, that Timothy was a timid dude. He just, he didn't have that like, you know, take the bull by the horns kind of perspective. And he had been given a ton of responsibility. And so Paul speaks into that. He, he speaks to, to Timothy's, you know, his tendency towards fear, towards source cowardice, towards retreating. But, but there's other ways that the flesh shows up. For some of you, like, you're not afraid of anything. Like, you grew up holding onto the horns of a bull. You're, you're the kind of person who's like, no, no, no. I, you remember pro, your flesh movement, your navigation, your leaning is going to be far more towards aggression, towards control, towards maybe domineering. Like, you got this and everyone's going to submit to it. Or maybe more passive aggressive, more manipulative or self-righteous, or you've got this, you don't need to depend on anybody else. Wherever your flesh leans will distort the gospel. And the reality, the true reality of what I articulated as the gospel, this is what's true, not according to your works, but according to his loving kindness, those are the things that will recenter you. So how do you fight? your natural flesh tendencies by rehearsing the particular implications of the gospel for you, which is exactly what Paul does for Timothy here. The famous ch- verse seven of First Timothy, Second Timothy chapter one says, for God gave us a spirit, not of fear, Timothy, but of power and love and self-control. Now, the Candidly, those are marks of being a disciple of Jesus, no doubt about it. This applies to everyone, right? God gave us a spirit of, and not fear. This is true for everyone. But the way fear is going to manifest itself is going to be different for everybody in this this room. And the particularities of of power and and love and self-control were particular for for Timothy. Saying, hey, he, Paul's saying, Timothy, you have to understand that you have a spirit of power who, who enables and sustains and, and brings about good and lasting through us, through you. 
as you surrender to him. That he's a spirit of love who enables us to see other people as more important than ourselves. And by the way, those of you who are more prone to its timidity, it's self-absorption, right? It's, it's I'm more concerned about how I'm going to come off or that I'm gonna look bad or I'm gonna look like an idiot. And so you retreat, right? And all the people that are like, I don't care how I come off are actually just as self-absorbed, right? It's all this, it, he's saying, no, you understand, but love says, how am I being experienced by you for your sake? It's the spirit of love so that it is that, all, that, that power, that the ability to do and use and be used by God is also cared for by and sustained by love. Because you know at the core that you are loved, as the gospel tells us. And it's also, Timothy, a spirit of self-control. Who, a spirit who is purposeful, who is not erratic, who's not out of control, but wise and keeping in subjection the, the fleshly passions and indulgences of our lives and, and guiding us towards the end that is the will of God for our good and for his good pleasure. There's a particular way in which the gospel is going to need to be infiltrated into your flesh in order to be an antidote to you taking care of you instead of you trusting Jesus, which is what the gospel invites, right? One of the things you guys probably aren't aware of is on probably every second or third Sunday when I'm preaching, Becky will lean over to me right before I go up, usually in this last song or during announcements or something like that. And she'll lean over and she will whisper, she'll whisper particular gospel truths for my particular way in which I get all wrapped up in me. Like I'm a performer, right? So I want, I want you guys to be impressed. I want you to trust me. I want to be funny, but I also want to be serious. You know, so I want, to, I want to come through, you know? And so she'll just lean over to me and she'll just whisper like, Matt, like, you've been appointed for this moment. Like God has something particular for these people this morning and he's trusting you with it. And so go knowing that he is going to meet them through you. No one else has this moment. You're, you've got it. And I can't tell you how powerful that is. And she, you know, has like a bunch of different ways in which she's communicated over the year. But for me, like it's antidote. It's like getting a serum to all my like performance tendencies, to all my, am I valuable? Do I matter? It, it undoes it and it says, oh, right. Like I'm, I'm loved by the Father and my invitation up here is to just invite you to him, to, to draw you towards the reality and the beauty and the, the transcendence and the imminence of who he is, to, to draw us to a place where this table becomes palpable and true and alive. That's, that's, that's my moment. That's what that, this moment is for. But I, I need a particular antidote. I need my, not fear, Matt, but, like, but, but power and, and love and, and self-control. And what is that in you? for you. That's how we guard the good deposit. You know how you guard the deposit of the gospel? Is by knowing the particular ways in which the gospel needs to be applied to your particular idolatries, to the particular unique weaknesses of your flesh. That's how we guard it. Well, the other way, the last way we guard it is by fanning into flame the Holy Spirit. Now, I know it's a strange way of saying it, that's pretty much what the Apostle Paul says in verse 6. He says, for, uh, for this I remind you, sorry, for this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Timothy, stir up the inner fire that is the Spirit of God and the particular ways. Keep it alive. Keep it, keep it stoked ablaze ongoingly alive. Now, I'm someone who loves fires, which is why I'm very sad that summer's coming because you can't make fires anymore unless, well, you're a fool and want to die outside. And so I, I, I love fires. And one of the great things about fires, I'm also just a bit of a, like if I'm by your fire and I start poking around at it, just know it's not contempt. It's just that I think there's a better way to do it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> My friends know this. They're like, you want to fix this, don't you? I'm like, can I? Um... <laughs> One of the things about fire, right, is that like it needs it needs constant care, it needs constant restoking, it needs constant fuel. Like it will actually burn itself out. And so there's a particular magic thing where if you have like too much smoke, it's because you don't have enough flame. And if you have too much flame, well, everyone's so hot, you have to be far back. You're not really enjoying the fire, and you need coals, and you need. So it's 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 art, right? 
I think Paul's using this phrase of really on purpose, that it's not like a, hey, Timothy, light a fire. And that's not what he says. He says, Timothy, there's a way in which you're going to need to keep this thing alive for your whole life. It's an ongoing journey of not too much, not too little, of being wise and discerning and discerning. And how is he supposed to fan this flame? How is he supposed to keep it ablaze? One is by just living out his calling, by exercising this charisma. They said this gift from God, which again, grace, this, this gift, these, these passions that he's put in him, these abilities that God has given him in the context of the places that he's put Timothy, and that's true of you. You know, one of the best ways to be able to actually keep something like alive, keep the spirit alive in you, is live in such a way that if the spirit's not alive in you, you're going to run into the wall. You're going to crash. You remember a few years back, we did, uh, we did a, uh, we spent a year talking about risk. And I know that people didn't love always the, the word, and, and that's fine. Um, but but some, of the, some of what was inside of that was what does it mean to live in such a way, to, to have to, to be taking steps of faith that if God doesn't come through, like the bottom drops out and you fall on your face. Like that's the kind of life that God's inviting us into. That's some of what he's telling Timothy here. He's saying, listen, you've been given power. You've, been, you've experienced the real gift of the Spirit. Now live like it. Fan it into flame use it. So as you use it, you will find that you need him more. And as you need him more, you will find that he is there more available and it will be fanned into flame. Secondly, he says to follow the pattern of sound teaching. Verse 13 says, follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that is in Christ Jesus. So, so, so live in the reality with the passion of the Spirit, the, the true gifts that God's given you. And then secondly, you got, you live in a way that actually is consistent with the rhythms that give us life. And we just did an entire series on rhythms, so I'm not going to reiterate that. But that's some of what we're talking about, is to live rhythmed with the graces of God. Live with the pattern, he says, with the, literally the ways of, the steps of sound teaching, the sound way of life. But I think the most significant thing is how is he supposed to fan this flame is by remembering that it's God who guards and who fans the flame. Verse 14, we return to the beginning. Paul says, by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, guard the good deposit. Now, we're natural, we're like, we're, for many of us, we're like, what am I supposed to do? Guard the good deposit. All right. How do I guard the deposit? Oh, you tell me what to do. I just gave you some things. You should get some discipline. You should get some people around you. Cool, you got it? It's like, Timothy, you don't have a chance. Loved ones, you don't have a chance to guard the deposit, to be able to stay alive to the reality of the gospel in you. It's not going to happen. You cannot do this. Like God is going to have to do it in you. God will do it in you. God is the one who is going to guard and plan, guard and fan this flame. It is the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. Which is why in verse 6 he says, fan into flame the gift of God. <laughs> the language is grace. It's offering. It's him doing it in us. As I said, Timothy doesn't have a chance to do it, and neither do we, unless we're leaning on the fact that it is God's spirit dwelling in us period. Now, there's in Paul's writing, all of his writing, the striking combination of, of, of God's sovereignty, right, of his good offering, of his good gifts, and, and the sense of our particular responsibility in them, which is not something that's super easy to reconcile at all times from, like, put it in a nice little theological box, but but in sharing the testimony, I think this is where Paul says it best. When he's sharing his testimony in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul, Paul takes the reality of like, God's going to need to do this in you. He has to make this happen in you. And at the same time, you participate, like full on. 1 Corinthians 15, 10, he says, that by the grace of God, I am what I am, which, first of all, you just put that on your tombstone. Like, that is just, like, by the grace of God, like, if I am anything, it is by the grace of God. 
period. He says, by the grace of God, I persecuted the church, but you know what? By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. Listen, on the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Okay, cool. Okay, so it is, it is the work. Wait. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Now, now this is maybe the best moment of the true tension. As Paul saying, listen, it's by grace that I am what I am. Like, there's nothing good here without the grace of God. He's, doing, he's done it all. And But by the way, he gave it to me, and he gave it to me on purpose because there was something he had for me to do and be, and, and I put my shoulder into it. Like, I gave myself to the work that God had given me to, and I worked, he says, I worked harder than everybody, and, and Paul's a pretty direct dude. He's like, hey, I, I just, I leaned in all the way. Oh, but just so you know, like, all my leaning in, all my putting my shoulder to it, that was grace too. That was actually God doing that through me. So what does it mean to be the kind of people who fan the flame, who guard? As we people who know that we know that we know that our full participation is an absolute thing, but it, it must be in response to the reality of the grace of God in you. It has to be. And any time we slide out from inside of that, any time it's not the grace of God, it's the responsibility you have. It's not the grace of God, it's ultimately the way in which you're going to make him happy with you. It's not just the grace of God, it's actually the way in which you're going to earn something from him because by golly, you've actually been pretty good. Anytime we slide out from that, we, we lose it, we've lost it. He says it is the grace of God in me. And this is true of you and me. We're not different. However much or however little we've received from God, either through our gifts or abilities, spiritual gifting or through our parents or through our, our background or spiritual friendship, we're being called to apply ourselves to an active self-discipline that is empowered by the grace of God at all times to keep fanning the inner flame of the Spirit by allowing God to fan the inner flame of the Spirit by asking Him and pleading with Him by by earnestly desiring it. And that's how we become the kind of men and women who live out the purposes that he has for us, that he's called us into, that he's made us for. Which is why Paul sits in prison, staring at death, and he's at peace. You know why? You hear right here in verse 12. He says, Timothy, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what he has entrusted to me. I know whom I have believed. What's the basis of Paul's confidence? I know whom I've believed. I know him. And that's the invitation and John Stott says this really great. He talk, he's talking about the church overall, but I think this applies to us individually. So I'm going to read this quote. Just take it in. This is true for us individually. This is true for the church, period. Ultimately, he says, it is God who is the guarantor of the gospel in us and in the church. It is his responsibility to preserve it. We may see the evangelical faith, the faith of the gospel spoken against everywhere, and the, and the apostolic message of the New Testament ridiculed. We may have to watch an increasing apostasy in the church in, as our generation abandons the faith of past generations. Do not be afraid. God will never allow the light of the gospel to be finally extinguished. True, he has committed it to us, frail and fallible creatures. He has placed his treasure in brittle earthenware vessels, and we must play our part in guarding and defending the truth. Nevertheless, in entrusting the deposit to our hands, he has not taken his own hands off of it. L listen, like in the deposit that he's made in you, he has not taken his hands off of you today. Like he's wanting to weave it more deeply into you. He is himself its final guardian, and he will preserve the truth which he has committed to the church. We know this because we know him in whom we have trusted and continue to trust. <laughs> 
So what's the summary of Paul, Timothy in, this first, in the first chapter? He's basically saying, listen, Timothy, like, stay connected. Stay connected to your past. Stay connected to your spiritual friendships, to your spiritual mentors. Stay connected to the scripture that formed you and stay connected to the spirit that empowers you. And then stay focused. Stay focused on the gospel itself and how it changes everything and everyone. Come back to it. Return to it. Stay focused on it. Guard it. Fan the flame of the gospel in you that was entrusted to you. And that's precisely what this, this meal is, right? This is, a, this is a gospel rehearsing practice that we do every single week. We come back and we, we, we act it out. We relive, we, we activate in a sense the reality that we have this beautiful good deposit that's been manifested for us in the life and death of Christ and that we get to now imbibe, to take in, to live out in front of one another. We live out the reality of the good news of Christ in us, Christ for us, and Christ coming back for us once again. So regardless of where you come from, how good your foundations were, how poor, where you find yourself today, like this meal is for all those who would say that I know whom I have believed. And you get to come, and you get to come as you are and receive the reality of the good deposit that's been made in you, and in so doing, to fan the flame just a little bit more. That we may be the people who, like Timothy, who was imperfect and needed a ton of support and all the encouragement of the world might be transforming the kingdom of God in ways we never could have imagined. Let's pray. Father, thank you for <laughs> the fact that we, we sit here, we stand here, um, having had the good deposit of the gospel put in us by your grace. And, and this meal, this cup and this bread is, is just that. It's this incredible reminder that by grace, for us, and that there's nothing that we can bring and add to it other than our surrender to you in it. And so that's what we want to receive today. This is the good deposit. We receive it by grace, and Lord, we want to practice it and live it out that we may transform the generation to come, that we may be the kind of people who hand off this good news to everyone we are with in our deeds and in our words in a way that brings your kingdom more and more to life. So we pray this in Christ. We receive these elements with joy and expectancy, trusting you for the future and for our lives, the promise of life which you have given us in Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, if you belong to Christ, if that this is a meal that's for you. It's a good news meal of the gospel for you. So come and welcome to Jesus Christ.